we'll get started with our second presentation of this session. Um, we have Alexander Dar from Virginia Tech. The title of his presentation is Eastern North American Indian Agroforestry Crops and Cultivation Reported by Early European Explorers. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, acknowledge and thank Katie Traza, who's in this room, for research assistance and support on this, as well as other co-authors, John Munsell and Jeff Kerwin. Uh, for suggesting this and supporting this research topic. So this uh, topic of this is focusing on one specific expedition by Europeans into the interior of North America um, and the tree crops that they reported along the way. Uh, basically the reason for going into this is that there's very little uh, in the literature about Native American agroforestry practices. Uh, there were, there's archaeological records of settlement up to 10,000 years in the southeast of the United States, which is what this research is focused on, um, and pretty much the only literature that relates to agriculture by these people was corn, beans, and squash, annual agriculture. Um, however, most of those crops were relatively recent introductions to the area. Uh, maize had only been grown since about, somewhere about 500 A.D., uh, and some of the squashes that we think of today, beyond being grown for seeds and for containers, some of the fleshy squashes uh, may have only been around since about 13 or 1500 AD. So that points to about 8,000 years of settlement by American Indians uh, where there was none of the traditional American Indian uh, agriculture that, that we typically think of. So, Furthermore, uh, in, in the research, uh, there shows a dramatic increase in some of these mass-producing trees uh, like oak, hickory, walnut uh, that corresponds with uh, American Indian settlement of those areas. Uh, you can link the archaeological records with the pollen records and the fossil records of these trees. Uh, and the ones that we th would think of as useful to people tend to, go tend to rise in population corresponding with settlement by, by humans. Uh, background on the DeSoto expedition, which is what uh, this, this research is focusing on. Uh, this was an expedition by Hernando de Soto, um, a Spanish conquistador. He had achieved fame and notoriety in the conquest of Peru and was given governorship of Cuba and uh, what was called the island of Florida. They basically thought that North America was a relatively small island bounded by the Mississippi River on the west, the Atlantic on the east, and an unknown ocean to the north. Uh, so the goal of this expedition was to kind of circumnavigate this island that they thought was reasonably small uh, and secure all the major ports, hopefully finding gold and hopefully starting a new uh, Spanish settlement like what they had done in South and Central America. Uh, of course, they didn't find any of those things. Basically, this was a three-year expedition uh, where most of the uh, over half of the explorers died. Hernando de Soto died at the, uh, about where that green line starts on the Mississippi River, and about half of the expedition uh, survived to make it back down to the Gulf of Mexico and uh, sailing, to, sailing to Mexico where there was, were Spanish settlements. So this was the first uh, expedition by Europeans into the interior of North America. Uh, this is why we chose this particular expedition as kind of a baseline for this, for this research. Uh, this would predate uh, the vast majority of the uh, European cultural exchange and plant exchange. So uh, it really gives us an idea of what kind of practices were pre-existing among American Indians at the time. And also uh, some of the disease that was spread by this expedition led to decimation of a lot of these tribes. So some of these tribes had never been contacted at, following this expedition. So in a lot of cases, the journals left by the men on this expedition give us some of the only glimpses into the into the, some of these cultures. So out of the, uh, this was an expedition of 600 men, 300 horses, whole pack of pigs and whole pack of dogs. Uh, it, was a, it was really a small army going through uh, the wilderness. Uh, from that expedition, four accounts uh, survived to today, until today, uh, one of which was a secondhand account um, by uh, a man called the Inca. He was a, a Spaniard who was raised in Peru and uh, his account is kind of a little sketchy. A lot of these accounts are biased because they were written for the king or written for personal glory. Uh, but the Inca's account is particularly biased. He was personally, account, personally uh, relating this expedition to the king 
so he had a lot of vested interest in making everything sound really great, that, that the New World was a great place, and that he should send lots more expeditions and lots more money, because everything was wonderful there. Uh, so just wanted to get that out of the way. The methods for, for, doing this, uh, for doing this research survey, we did document analysis, searching for key words uh, in electronic documents of these, ex of these narratives, uh, cross-referencing various narratives with each other to attempt to account for bias and account for the audience that these were being written for. Uh, we were able to find where lots of these crops lined up uh, with with the, in the same location and in the same season between, all, between three or, or even all four of the accounts, uh, which gives us pretty good confidence that uh, what they were saying was true, uh, that all the stories lined up uh, in terms of location, in terms of seasonality for a lot of these crops. Uh, another issue with this was that a lot of these crops were completely unfamiliar to Europeans, and we'll, I'll go over a few of those in a little bit. but. Uh, by referencing the seasonality, uh, the location, and the, uh, the physical descriptions of these plants, we're able to make pretty reasonable uh, guesses as to what the true identity of these were. A lot of uh, plants were referred to by what the most similar thing that the Europeans were, were, were familiar with, but uh, we know now, uh, of course, what the plants were. So we're going to start getting into uh, the crops that were referenced. Uh, plum is one of the was, was probably the most common uh, reference in these journals. And they talk about there being two different kinds of plums. There was the plums similar to what they were used to in Spain. Uh, but it's interesting that they note that the ones in North America were much better uh, than what they had in Spain, even though there was a, uh, a, a history of, of horticulture and, and, and producing the best variety of these plums. Uh, the ones that they said grew wild and without cultivation, which is suspect. But um, they, anyway, they said that the, the ones in North America were much better. And we come to the second kind of plum they refer to as being small, being gray, being soft, having three or four seeds, uh, also being much better than what they were used to in Spain. Uh, but we infer this to be referring to the American persimmon. Of course, no native plums have more than, the, more than one stone. Uh, the history, it's interesting to note that, that there was a, uh, a practice of processing and, and storing these, these persimmons through drying, which is similar to what we see in Asia among traditional societies. Uh, so there was, this points to a culture around these crops that uh, may not have been a simple gathering them when they're fresh and edible, that there was, that there was intentional storage and processing of a lot of these crops. Uh, next we uh, there's mulberries, and again, these were referred to as the trees were of better character, the leaves were softer, the berries were juicier and, and bigger and tastier than what they were used to in Spain, where they're being farmed and intentionally cultivated. Uh, and in the New World, the Spanish were interested in cultivating silk plantations. They saw this as a, as a pretty important cash crop, so they always made note of mulberry trees when they saw them in their journals. Uh, the, the Time and time again, uh, during the summer months in these journals, again, it was three years, so we get lots of different seasons of, uh, of exposure to a lot of these plants, uh, just refer to the incredible abundance of these trees, that, uh, that there was no end to them. A lot of times when the Spanish would come to a new village, uh, there would be a greeting party sent out of up to 100 men, each carrying several bushels worth of mulberries as kind of a, as a gift for these, uh, for these visitors. Um, and usually, typically, uh, it wasn't a tribute. There was, this was, there was not a lot of violence on this expedition. There was, there was definitely some, and I don't want to discount that, uh, but largely the interactions between the Spanish and the Native Americans was peaceful. Um, one of the most important crops uh, that we come to is, is the hickory nuts. Of course, the Europeans were not familiar with the hickory plant, so they refer to them as, as small, interesting walnuts, basically. Uh, they say that they found these small acorn-shaped walnuts that were, again, much tastier than what they were used to in Spain. Um, but this is, uh, this is another uh, crop that there was an extreme abundance of. Early, uh, early botanists following this expedition would talk about uh, uh, individual families having hundreds of bushels of these stored away for the winter. Uh, there's really strong evidence that this was one of the major winter subsistence crops in North America. They refer to uh, a, a large-scale processing of these, of these nuts, that they would pound them uh, in the shell, boil everything together, uh, and then the oil and the fat would rise to the top, which would, could be skimmed off. 
and stored as a solid butter uh, all winter long. That this was, and it was, it was a delicacy. The Europeans talked about how that there was, first of all, there was no end to this butter in a lot of these villages. That there was such incredible abundance that they were able to support an extra 600 men uh, off of this, off of the stores of this. In addition to uh, keeping the village going, they do say that it uh, it produced tremendous flatulence. But uh, again, it was tasty enough. It was delicious enough that they that they kept going back for more, and that that, that didn't seem to slow them down at all. Uh, with walnuts, they also refer to, to to the walnuts similar to what they were familiar with in Spain, uh, but. In this passage, uh, we see that they refer to uh, fields filled with walnut trees planted equidistant from each other, uh, that it reminded him of a, of a park in Europe, uh, that there, it points to an open, there was an open forest, there was not a lot of undergrowth, um, and there was, there was kind of even spacing and openness to this, uh, again, pointing to some, some sort of, of management of these crops. So I've... Uh, mentioned a number of times that there was an incredible abundance of, of everything that was available. Uh, the Europeans spent three winters on this expedition where they would settle down for up to five months uh, and, and be basically sedentary for those time periods. They would usually stay in, uh, in villages. A lot of times the, the, the amenities of the village were made, made available to the Europeans. Uh, in 1541, they refer to one village as being so comfortable that they did, really didn't even want to continue on with the journey. They were this was this was in the middle of uh, in the middle of, of South Carolina. They were nowhere near achieving all their goals, but they said there was such comfort and abundance here that they really felt no need to go on. So they stayed for five months here with enough plums, mulberries, hickories uh, to keep them alive over the winter. There are several references to corn and maize, um, but again. Uh, not with nearly the same uh, sort of uh, reverence or excitement that was pointed to over, around a lot of these tree crops like persimmons and plums and hickories and mulberries. Uh, and then we see that this uh, quotes from these diaries uh, say that all of these crops are growing abundantly in open fields uh, without it being necessary to plant or cultivate them. Um, I'm not sure how much this, how much they were familiar with whatever sort of cultivation or management practices there were, uh, but I think we can all see that in the forest today, uh, you won't find nearly this abundance in a, in a grown up forest and that you won't see the openness. Even if you go into a, a, a stand of virgin forest, it won't be open enough for you to ride your horse at full gallop through, uh, which is what we hear references to time and time again. Uh, the references to park-like atmosphere um, and wide openness in a, in a savanna-like setting in the southeast is not something that we see today. And it really points strongly uh, towards cultivation. Um, this is a diagram from our friends at uh, WPP. And it, uh, if you look at this quote from uh, the gentleman from Elvis, who was, uh, I'll, I'll mention that this, this man was, is considered one of the least biased sources. He was a Portuguese uh, military officer that was along for the ride, basically. He had no real stake in Spain's success in this journey. Uh, so this is seen as one of the more, as a, as a personal journal rather than something for, uh, for glory and fame. Uh, but he refers to open fields of, of, of hickories and walnuts, uh, many mulberry trees, plum trees, uh, the persimmon trees, the gray different plums is, is how he refers to them, uh, set out in gardens in a clear grove. And that the fact that it was like this for two whole days of marching, uh, they, they often covered 15 to 20 miles a day. So this is 40 straight miles of open garden filled with mulberry, hickory, persimmon, plum, uh, all in incredible abundance, wide open spacing. Uh, really st strongly implies that there was intentional management. Uh, we know from cultural records and archaeological records that there was management of forests by fire, by, live, by game, uh, driving wild game, uh, by girdling specified trees uh, to reduce competition. Uh, so I see it as a pretty strong hypothesis that there was intentional management of these forests for tree crops, even though this is not something that's, that's referenced in the literature uh, anywhere at all. So this gets us to the, to the conclusion that um, I believe with all of these with all these points that I've made, with the abundance, uh, with the, the openness of the forests, 
uh, that there were cult that there was uh, a culture built up around the processing and storage of these crops. Um, that there there was a large scale agroforestry system throughout at least the southeast of the United States. Uh, this area had been inhabited for for eight to ten thousand years before the Europeans got here. So even if there was no uh, there was there may not have been planting or grafting or uh, you know, clearing of land to establish new forests, uh, but there may have been a, a kind of low maintenance, low input, self-sustaining agroforestry system in place for generations, uh, that there had been cultural practices around promoting and maintaining this forest, uh, which is something that we all, I know in, in, I know in permaculture that's something we look at as we, we want to establish a low maintenance, self-perpetuating self system. Uh, so I see this as kind of evidence that those that that's possible. It's, it takes long-term practice and it takes an intergenerational respect for these trees. Uh, but I believe that this strongly points to that this, that these ideas at least aren't radical, that this is something that, that is a, was an existing practice that goes back for, for thousands of years. All right, thank you. That could be, yeah. And again, when Alex, I, could you repeat? The oh, yeah, sure. sure. Um, Mike says that there is a description of, of nuts that are easily easily crushed. Uh, says they're more like pecans than walnuts. And when when they say walnuts in those uh, in those statements, I, I am under the impression that it's, it could be anything in the Juglandaceae family. Could be hickories. Could be pecans. Um, and yes, that makes sense. I did. I made it last fall. I think it's it's it is incredibly delicious. You can make it. It can depending on how long you process it, it can be anywhere from a porridge uh, to a thick butter uh, like what you would see in the store. I would like to see that become something that's in you know that starts getting into farmers markets and health food stores and and, and niche markets as a as a new unique local local food um, and especially one a nut product that can be grown in in the east. A lot of these nut butters are coming from out west and irrigated. Uh, Intent, like irrigated uh, industrial agriculture, but in, I know at least in Virginia we have a large quantity of hickory nuts growing in the mountains already established um, that are going unused. I think there's a lot. Wild harvesting can get us to the point, can, can maybe start the process, um, and while uh, some sort of agroforestry becomes to come online for, for hickory production. It, it is a much it's a, it's a much tastier. It, it has a higher fat content, higher protein content than than say peanut butter. Um, when you say butter, do you mean like a, like a peanut butter or like a, just a fat and oil? It's 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 a little bit of both. Um, it is a, it's kind of an oilier product than what you get out of the peanut butter, um, but it's still it's about it's about thirty percent oil and thirty percent protein. Um, so it's 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 a very high calorie <coughs> product. Katie. Uh, only in Florida, and that was actually something where they mentioned that there was uh, intentional cultivation, that there were rows of these trees planted out. Um, and in Florida, there was, there was also pineapple, and there was uh, papaya, and a number of different, different tree fruits that were grown like that. There were a couple of references to the fruit being bigger than they were in Spain. And I know they're different species, but if there were planted orchards, I wonder if there's any kind of evidence that there was some selection going on for uh, large food. Yeah, and that's something that in the literature there is no evidence. There have been people that have been looking for that evidence. Hasn't been found yet. Um, it seems like just as a result of normal day-to-day uh, -day practicing of, of selecting, you would, you'd rather pick a bigger mulberry and take that back to camp where it would be more likely to, to, to grow from seed. It makes sense, and that's how every other crop was domesticated in the early years. Um, but there's no there's no published evidence of that yet. Yes. Yeah, wondering if you've had a chance at all um, to speak to any descendants of people who have been living in this area when the expedition came through, and and hear their thoughts about what you're finding in the literature. That's something I'd like to continue. This was basically a survey of just document analysis, um, but something I can say that. Uh, exists today is a 
Hickory culture among the Cherokee. The Cherokee would have lived in this area before they were transported to reservations, forced into reservations in Oklahoma. Um, but even today, there exists a culture of uh, collecting uh, hickory nuts and processing them in the similar way that their ancestors would have. And it's seen by a lot of them as a really sacred, important practice that connects them back to their cultural homeland. Uh, and this is a, something that hasn't really been reported on very much. I saw it in an article, an ethnobiology article, uh, but basically that there's processing of, of hickory nut balls, kind of like, um, kind of like the, the paste that's made with almonds. I can't think of the name right now. Um, but it's a similar, it's a dessert. It's really rich. It's really tasty. And, and, and people, references to people driving for 200 miles to, to get these hickory nut balls from the, from the few elders that still had the practices for making them. I've got a friend who started a business picking up wild hickories, and they have one of those pressurized pecan, uh, you know, de hullers. But uh, it seems like this is probably a way lower maintenance or you know lo lower lower cost way, um, certainly less labor. Of yeah. Just letting the fat come to the surface. Yeah, they didn't bother with de with separating the shells from the nut meats. Basically, you just crushed everything and boil everything and let it let it naturally separate. So it seems like a pretty pretty good way to do it. That's where the calories are. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Just curious to know what your thoughts are about where you might go in the future. Or has this study given you ideas of things that you think should be promoted or studied or that you should engage in in the future? Something that I'm interested in is um, working with, there's a, few, there's a few ways to go with this. Um, present day forest ecology around historical Native American sites, um, seeing if the present day forest ecology is, is measurably different from areas that were not under, uh, under recent settlement, see if there's more mass producing trees around those areas. Um, another topic is working with archaeologists. I've talked to a number of Native American archaeologists who say that they need more botanists and foresters on their team, that they maybe don't they have trouble identifying when the seeds or nuts may have mixed, may have blown in there or may have may, may be a sign of, of uh, some sort of cultural practices. Uh, one study showed that in, in a trash midden that hickory shells outweighed any other uh, organic matter, that it was more than charcoal, it was more than uh, animal bones, more than anything else was hickory shells um, in some of these. And this was dating to six to 10,000 years ago. Um, so looking at, look, working more with archaeologists and also doing cultural uh, interviews with tribal elders to see if there, there are still stories, to see if there's an oral history around some of these practices that may not have been reported on yet. Hey, one more. You were you're focusing on the edibles, obviously, but there are other plant parts that were utilized in the culture as well, whether it be baskets or yep. other things. So, did you explore any of that in your? Uh, the, one, the one thing that, that came up a lot was that mulberry tree, uh, that the inner bark was used as a thread, as a fiber, um, and that the women of the tribes would use this for the, the mulberry thread for clothing and baskets, uh, containers. Um, fi found lots and lots of references to that. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Very interesting. Good luck in the future.